Please turn to the sheet that you have in front of you. This is Dharma request before a lecture. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto sujeto ye alahadi samyao samputo che. Namo sadanto sujeto ye alahadi samyao Together, Wu Sang Sen Sen Wei Miao Fa, Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu, Wo Jing Jian Wen De Sou Shi, Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma. And a hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Honorable Master, all fellow Dharma friends, good evening. Tonight we are about to start our sutra lecture on the Avatamsaka Sutra, also known as the Flower Garland Sutra. And so to begin the sutra lecture, we usually recite the Buddha's, the sutra's name. So you can find that on the front of the cover of the sutra. So we we'll recite the title seven times. So you're welcome to join me and put your palms together um, to pay our respects and invite the Bodhisattvas and the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to come join us in this assembly. Namo da fang guang bo wa yen jing wa yen nai we po bu zai namo da fang guang bo wa yen jing wa yen nai we po bu to tonight's Sutra Lecture. We're here in Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Today is May 3rd, 2014, a Saturday night. And we're about to lecture 
um, the Buddha's Flower Garland Sutra of Great Expansive Teachings, also known as the Avatamsaka Sutra. So if you could open your sutra text to page 57, we will, uh, we will start lecturing on the fifth ground. Is the mic? Is it better if I use the other mic? I seem to be an echo. What might I use? This one? I think they're using this one. Yeah. It's okay. There's kind of an echo. You hear ing? Hello? Hello? Is there still there? Hello? 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 Okay, well, I think we'll work out the technical difficulties. So, to, we're in the chapter with a slight ringing sound. Okay. It feels like we're in a cave. <laughs> well, the Bodhisattva on the fifth ground probably is not disturbed by sound at all. <laughs> so, we'll just be patient with the sound. Is that mic? Okay. sound hello okay this is good okay so the bodhisattva on the um we're right now in the avatamsaka sutra it's broken up to many sections and so the chapter we're on today is the 10 grounds chapter and within the 10 grounds chapter we have uh, many love i mean there's basically 10 grounds of practice and we're right now in the middle of the 10 grounds we're on the fifth ground and the title of this ground is called the ground of difficult conquest so one can think of this sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, as a guide, as a handbook for a bodhisattva who wants to cultivate the bodhisattva path. And so we get a chance to see how a bodhisattva practices, how he thinks, how he speaks, how he acts. And so it's a very, you could say, inspirational text. It's a very pragmatic text. It's a very um, useful text that gives us guidance for how to um, create our own direction in life and also how to practice the way. So as the last couple of lectures have gone a lot into kind of overviews and kind of detailed discussions and various points, what I thought was today we just might start immediately with the sutra text and, um, and just go from there. So we're on page 56 and 57. If you open the sutra text, we're on the first verse. Two weeks ago, Dharma Master Fan actually just lectured on the first line of the, of the verse. So we'll start with that whole verse again um, to finish that verse. So it's on page the top of page 56 and then the first verse on page 57. So if you everybody could... Actually, I'll recite it first and you can recite it back. I'll use the, the verse, the tune that we have of Reverend Hongshur developed. Ji Fu Zi Sang Gong De Ji Ji Fu Zi Sang Gong De Jing Ching Fang Bian Guan Sang Di Jing Ching Fang Bian Guan Sang Di Fu Li Suo Jia Ju Nian Hui Fu Li Suo Jia Ju Nian Hui so we can read the English together. He amasses blessings and wisdom, supreme merit and virtue. With vigor, diligence, and expedience, he contemplates the superior ground. Sustained through the Buddha's power, he is endowed with mindfulness and wisdom, so he completely understands the four truths as they really are. So, uh, tonight we will begin with the second line, because uh, two weeks ago we had an extensive uh, lecture on the first line. So tonight the the topic um, for the first, the second line is. With vigor, diligent expedience, he contemplates the superior ground. 
Actually, just for some people who maybe it's first time here at the lecture, um, we're in the verses here of the sutra text. So actually, it's a you could say a summary of the text before. There's a prose section and there's a verse section. So in the verse section, it basically kind of encapsulates the principles given in the prose section. You can say maybe it's an aid to memory. It's a way to make the teachings go in a different way because verse has a different, uh, you could say, a f different feel to it. It's a little bit more creative. Maybe the left brain, right brain, it helps it go in a different, different part of the brain. Um, yeah, it's also an oral tradition. So it's something that allows us to keep it in our minds and hear it in a different way. So for this section, um, with vigor, diligence, and experience, he contemplates the superior ground. It talks about the bodhisattva cultivating with vigor, um, cultivating with diligence, and using expedience. Um, tonight, uh, Jing Hushu and myself were planning on going over the Four Noble Truths, particularly the Eightfold Path, in, in, um, per, um, in, uh, in some depth. So we were thinking that the, for vigor and diligence, it falls quite nicely in the Eightfold Path. So you'll hear a little bit about that more in detail. But I wanted to speak a little bit about expedience, because that's something we often read in the sutras, and we um, kind of think, well, so what's, what is that? What are expedience? Oftentimes, um, it's also translated as skill and means, or skillful means, or provisional teachings. Um, the Chinese for it is often fang bian, fang bian fa. And so, this bodhisattva cultivates expedience. So, when we always translate the word expedience, sometimes it has a little bit of a negative kind of connotation. It's kind of like something you do um, almost, uh, almost, it's almost like, well, it's not really how it is, but you're just kind of um, giving something so that uh, just to get get through, to get through, get kind of patch up something so that you expediently do something to get get through something. Um, in a little way, there is that kind of connotation in the Buddhist teachings, but in the same way, it doesn't have any kind of negative uh, of a kind of self uh, self get benefit from the from the idea of expedience. Rather, the expedience that the Bodhisattva uses is completely selfless. He uses it to teach living beings according to their potentials, or maybe um, even here. Um, is able to understand what expedience, what the expedience to use to cultivate the ways to to go step by step to the Buddha's awakening. So, I think in terms of expedience, it's an important teaching also because it allows us to access the teachings at many different levels. Um, in the beginning, the Buddha taught a certain teaching, and then he slowly built it up bit by bit as his disciples became more and more experienced in the Dharma. And so just like you say, we go to school and we learn mathematics, we start with you know, addition, then we may learn multiplication and long division, then we learn algebra, and then finally there's some calculus. So step by step, we get prepared for more and more advanced forms of, of teachings. And so here on the 10 grounds chapter, it's actually quite a high level teaching um, of what, what the Buddha is, what the Bodhisattva is practicing. So here he says next is he contemplates the superior ground. He looks to the next ground, the sixth ground, and he thinks what he needs to cultivate to enter the sixth ground. Next it says, sustained through the Buddha's power, he is endowed with mindfulness and wisdom. Um, this is another uh, principle I think is often we see in the Avatamsaka Sutra and the Mahayana Sutras, which is that of being aided by the Buddha. Um, reading various commentaries, uh, the Royal Master often says how if we we don't see it, but the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are always supporting us and caring for us and benefiting us. And so without their support, our, uh, we would have a lot of suffering that we wouldn't know existed. <laughs> that that they're, they're kind of in the background um, taking care of, trying to help us out. Um, I think... Maybe one analogy I can give for this um, is actually a story given the Lotus Sutra. Um, it also connects with the idea of expedience. Uh, people know the story of the the, the Buddha 
um, the Lotus Sutra speaking about the story where the son runs off from his father. Have you heard remember that story? Um, the story goes that there was a son who wasn't a very good son. Uh, he basically, at a, at a kind of, when he said he came of age, he told his father that he wanted to go and leave. The, leave. And so he took his, his kind of, um, his amount of the inheritance, he took his money, some money, and he left the family. And he went off to strike out his own fortune. And in this process, he actually ended up squandering all his money uh, and coming back, becoming poor and destitute to the point that he forgot his, he, he, even where he came from, you know, what his background was. He was just impoverished and in a lot of suffering. And so one day, he came by the house of his, his, his father. And when he saw his father's home, he saw it was a very rich man's house. Somebody who was very powerful lived there. And as he saw the, there in the front gate, he, was actually, he had a little bit of fear. He said, oh no, if I get caught in front of this place, they might think that I'm a, I'm a thief. And they might, uh, they might lock me up and, 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 uh, and have me arrested. So he started kind of running away. He said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. Well, the father of the household looked out and saw that his son, who at this time was, was like a beggar, impoverished, outside the front gate, and he recognized his son. He said, oh, that's my son. And so he told his uh, workers, he says, please go, 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 go get that man, bring him back. <laughs> of course, his son, being already afraid of his uh, being caught as a thief, saw these, uh, these men running after him to catch him and, uh, and actually fainted because he was so scared. So he fainted uh, and then woke up and he was now in this household. And at this point, his father thought, okay, if I tell him that he's my son, he'll be so scared and, and shocked, he'll go into maybe like a, a state of shock. So I can't tell him that. So what he did was, okay, I'll give him a job to do. So he basically told him, you know, he can maybe uh, shovel manure, he can take care of the grounds. And so as year and year went by, he had him do some of the basic menial work, maybe start a little bit more of the skilled work, then have him be um, managing some people, and then start taking care of the general affairs of the household. And finally, as this, as this man became more and more responsible, he said, oh, you're, you, you can take care of all the household affairs. And then finally, at the, at the end of his life, at the very end, he said, you know, actually everything I have is yours. You're actually my son. But at that time, he was already prepared to hear that so he could accept the Buddha's teaching at that point. So that's how, you can say on one level, the Buddha was using expedience, but step by step, to teach us and bring us to the Bodhisattva path. At the same time, you can see the Buddha sustaining uh, his son, in this case, through his kindness and compassion, although the son didn't even know it. For him, you know, he was just at this, living in his household, doing some work. But you know that constantly behind his employer at that time was a sense of kindness and wish for his well-being and want him to grow up and truly inherit the entire household. And so that's, you could say, in the spirit of what the, the Buddha is doing with us. I think we also can often see it with parents, with their children. They always have this kind of constant care and concern for their kids or for teachers with their students, always want their students to succeed. If the student doesn't open their eyes to that way of seeing things, you know, they can just take their parents for granted or always think their teachers are trying to give them a hard time. And since they put on those blinders, they never see the kindness and they'll never see that they're actually sustained through the aid and power of their parents or teachers. So for us on the Buddhist path, cultivating the, the Buddhist path, um, we definitely want to acknowledge and reflect on the kindness that the Buddha of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. So here, it's very clear the Buddha is actually aided by the Buddha's power, and by that, he has mindfulness and wisdom. Okay, so next, the next line what we have is that he completely understands the four truths as they really are. And so today, this is actually what uh, we were hoping to focus on, because it's a very rich topic, and we thought it was very practical because the four truths are something we can apply in our daily lives. Um, so, would you like to talk about? Yeah. Yes. I just following about what Jin Chuan Shu just mentioned, I think it would be a good time to say 
or to ask, do, does anyone know whose birthday is it tomorrow? Hin is not mine. <laughs> tomorrow is the Buddha's birthday. So, um, Jin Chashu just said that the Buddha is always next to us, trying his best. Um, the Buddha and the Bodhisattva is trying their best to help us improve. So, for tomorrow's birthday, you can actually give the Buddha a present. And I think the Buddha would be very happy. It sounds weird, but bear with me. The Buddha would be very happy if you could give him your afflictions. Tell the Buddha, Buddha, I'm filled with anger. Please take my anger away from me. And he'll be more than happy to take it from you. So any afflictions you have, you can make a vow tomorrow. Tomorrow's one of the best ways to make a, a, a vow of practice. If, there's, if you recognize an unwholesome benef- um, trait in you, and you want to get rid of it. You can go to the Buddha tomorrow, especially if you go to the, um, the City of 10,000 Buddhas in Ukiah, you can join in the bathing Buddha ceremony. As you bathe the Buddha, I say, Buddha, my present to you is my anger. <laughs> Please remove all my anger. Yeah. So coming back to the text, uh, the last line of the first paragraph, so he completely understands the four truths as they really are. So they gave us an idea to base, to have a theme for tonight, and we thought the theme would be the four truths, or more specifically, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. And why have we chosen that? Um, the four truths is actually included in, or you could say is part of the Noble Eightfold Path, and vice versa, because the first, um, the first right view, which is the first um, category of the Noble Path, contains the four truths. And the fourth truth, which is the way to, um, to liberation, is actually the eight noble full path. So they're both intertwined. And there's another way also to see this. You often hear of the Buddha's teachings as being classified into three categories. Precepts, which is sila or moral conduct. Samadhi, which is concentration. And then wisdom. So the Buddha's teaching is always grouped into these three categories. It's like a three-legged stool. Precepts, samadhi, and wisdom, they are all the same. They they have the same foundation. Or rather, that's the foundation of your practice. If you remove any one of them, and you're sitting on a stool, you're going to fall. So the three of them form a very stable stable base. And you could say that precepts precepts form... um, Without precepts, or without samadhi, or without wisdom, your practice does not have a firm foundation, and it will not lead to the right um, right outcome. This is the result of lack of preparation. My apologies. So. We, because we've already touched on the Four Noble Truths in um, a few lectures before, today what we'll do is we'll just skim through the Four Truths and we'll go right through the Eight Noble Full Path. The Four Noble Truths are the first one. Life is unsatisfactory. What does that mean? It means it's that feeling you get when you tell yourself, I would be happier if I had that new phone. If only I had that new car, if only I have a girlfriend, a boyfriend, if I could get that job, or is that unsatisfactoriness that forces you to accept your life for what it is, for you to settle for less than what you want. That's the first noble truth. The second noble truth tells you where does that stress, that that itch, that unsatisfactory in life, where does that come from? So the second noble truth tells you that it comes from desire, attachment. Once you have desire, once you have attachment, either to material forms or to um, anything that exists, to yourself, to the ego, you cause stress. And then the third noble truth, the Buddha says, this can end, this stress, this unsatisfactoriness, this happiness that you're always reaching for, it can end and you can actually achieve ultimate happiness. And the fourth noble truth tells you how. 
and the how lies in the Noble Eightfold Path. So do people know the Noble Eightfold Path? So this we say the the list of things to remember. We said each each lecture will have a list to remember. So this would be the good list to remember. Do you know what the first one is? Anyone want to take a guess? It starts with often the word right. All these have a word right in before them. The first one's right. Right view. Right view is the first one. Or often, sometimes it's translated as right understanding. It's the right way of seeing things. Um, how about the second one? Right work? Work, yes. There is work. There is work. Word. Words. So speech. Okay. So how about the second? The second one, though. The, 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 you just gave number five, I think, and number three. Yeah, right thought or right... As, because I'm sure it's aspiration or resolve. Your your intent is correct, is is right. Okay, so third one. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Number four. You can say maybe right work, right action, right action. The things you do is correct, and then the next one. Livelihood. livelihood yes, right livelihood, and then right. What's the next one? Vigor, right rigor or right effort. And then the number seven? Mindfulness. Mindfulness, right, mindfulness. Oh, he, he, we were, since we were prepared, so you should know. And then number eight? Right concentration, yes. So right concentration. So if you look at the list, you have, it's very interesting, but the, for, the Eightfold Path actually starts with the idea of wisdom first. So right view and right aspiration fall under uh, wisdom. It's a way of seeing things. While right speech, right action, right livelihood, and right effort are actually all under the, the category precepts, what you do, your, your conduct. And then finally, right mindfulness and right concentration deal with samadhi, concentration. So those, those are what uh, Jing Hushu just mentioned, the, stool, the three legs of the stool, Precepts, Samadhi, and Wisdom, or Prajna. But actually it's a very interesting connection because the idea is that you first start with a, the right way of seeing things, but actually the, the whole loop goes back on itself. So for instance, after you develop right mindfulness, right concentration, it allows you to actually develop a truly a right view and true right aspiration. And what do I mean by that? Um, in the beginning, uh, you have the right view and right aspiration based on your maybe study of the Dharma. Um, for instance, we learn about the Buddha's teachings and we read it and we go, oh, that makes sense. And so we base our life on these teachings and we try to practice in this way. But at a certain point, we actually see it for ourselves. So they say the true right view and true right aspiration is actually, for instance, realizing the Four Noble Truths. So once you see that, you actually have a, an awakening. So this, um, this Eightfold Path is very interesting because it kind of folds onto itself. You s I people always say that the, uh, the three non awful practices of precepts, money, and wisdom all kind of are like an upward going spiral. You know, just like greed, hatred, and delusion are a downward circling spiral. If you have precepts, money, and wisdom, as you cultivate each one, they build on each other to help you go up. And so, here, um, this these the noble eightfold path is kind of shows us very concretely how this works. So today we wanted just to go over these these uh, these factors. You want to say that? Yeah. yeah. So, if anyone has ever studied Buddhism before, the first thing that you will learn are the noble four truths, and then the second thing you will learn will be the eight noble four path. So this. These two teachings, you could say, are the most basic or the introductory teachings. But all the teachings of the Buddha, even what um, we're reading in the Avatamsaka Sutra, can be distilled back to this um, Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. So although, like what Jin Chuan Shu said, like a spiral, you start off at the base, 
But as you go up, the principles remain the same, but the conditions which you apply them to change. So for us right now, we're still trying to master or to understand, uh, to go beyond the theory of the Four Noble Truths. And then the Bodhisattva on the fifth ground completely understands the Four Truths. So you can see that the principles um, are really profound in that they can apply to both at a very coarse level and at a very fine level uh, within the mind. So what I want to do is go over the first one, which is right view and right aspiration. Now, I think this is actually a very rich, um, a very a meaningful uh, factor, I guess, in the Noble Eightfold Path, which I'll probably spend most of the time on, uh, because I think it basically sets your course in your practice. If you don't have the right view or right understanding, you could practice a lot and you end up in the wrong place. And so, um, so how do you think about this? Well, your right view is kind of like what is the fundamental way you look at the world, how you approach life. What are the values we have? What, is, um, what do we think is important? Uh, how do we measure success? You know, those are the things that uh, we, I think, really, really important. Before we start practicing, we should reflect on ourselves and think, so what, what is the basis of what I'm doing? Um, oftentimes, if we don't do that, well, we live a life based on values that are not really reflected on. We just kind of work from whatever we got as a kid, and we just use our whole life, and oftentimes that leads us to places that we don't, later on in our life, 50 years later, we go, how did I get here? I don't want this, because we never actually looked, looked deeper to see what's, what are the underpinnings of our way of seeing the world. And in fact, I'll say oftentimes, these things are planted in our minds very, very uh, subconsciously as children. So I did a little bit of uh, looking on the web on, on kind of the, the kids and what we get as a kid, um, kind of growing up, the assumptions we might develop. And I read something that I thought was very interesting, which was from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which are the doctors who help uh, young children and adolescents. So this is, they, they made a resolution uh, for advertising. <laughs> and basically, this is what they said. They said, um, research has shown that young children, younger than eight years, are cognitively and psychologically defenseless against advertising. They do not understand the notion of intent to sell and frequently accept advertising claims at face value. In fact, in the late 1970s, the Federal Trade Commission held hearings reviewing the existing research and came to the conclusion that it was unfair and deceptive to advertise to children younger than six years old. What kept the FTC from banning such ads was that it was thought to be impractical to implement such a ban. However, some Western countries have done exactly that. Sweden and Norway forbid all advertising directed at children younger than 12 years. Greece bans toys advertising until after 10 p.m. And Denmark and Belgium severely restrict advertising aimed at children. And they have a, a number of uh, resolutions that they made. They say pediatricians should be familiar with the methods of advertisers used to target children and adolescents. And they says they shouldn't buy magazines and put them out in their waiting rooms that have these advertisements in them. And they should educate kids on the way that the media, uh, they should teach media li literacy to the kids so that they know what they're seeing. So it's an interesting, it's, it's a resolution made in 2006, which they, they had a reaffirmation of it in 2010. And um, I don't know if it's became an actual, I might guess it's probably not. I haven't watched TV for quite a while, so I don't know if it's, you know, kids still watch, have, have, have a, this kind of ads targeted at them when they're kids, but my guess is probably. When I was eight years old, I would always pester my mom to buy cereal because of the free toy inside. And I would eat until I get the toy, or sometimes I couldn't wait, I would just pour out all the cereal, get the toy, play with it, and realize that I was actually cheated. Because what was on the box, what the box promised, or my perception of what the toy was, was not delivered by the toy. And I must say that 20 years later, I still believe. <laughs> I never learned. So yeah, these things get planted in the mind very subconscious. It's kind of funny, because I actually had the same story 
I was going to give about that, but I was actually, I remember that was a peanut butter Captain Crunch. And I, and I, and I forced my mom, who's actually here, to buy, buy that, that cereal to me, and I was very disappointed how bad it tasted. So I had that feeling of being cheated. I was like, oh gosh, this cereal tastes awful. And then I had to eat it because I forced my mom to get it. <laughs> so I couldn't, I, couldn't be, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't fess up to it being bad cereal. So, um, so yeah, so I think it's really important to look at it because we get a lot of basically um, kind of seeds that get planted in our minds as young children. And one of it is advertising. And what does advertising teach us? Well, if you look at it, it teaches us that um, happiness comes from material objects. You know, that, that our happiness comes from buying that thing on the TV screen or on the computer screen now or on the magazine ad. And, um, and, it, and it does it in many subtle ways. It might say, because you'll be really cool if you have this product or you'll be very attractive to other people if you have this product or you'll have some status if you have this product or this just tastes really, really good you should just treat yourself to some something that's very, very, very good. Or maybe they even, now it's very interesting, they even say it's healthy for you. I was quite shocked when I went to, uh, which was when I was a layman in 2006, I think, still. I was a layman still. And I remember going to the, the local shopping store and, uh, and seeing a potato chip being advertised as healthy. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. They're advertising potato chips as healthy. And I thought, that's and that made me even more disturbed because I thought, well, that means if they're actually advertising that. That means some people might actually believe that, which to me was even more disturbing. It's like, so people actually are eating it thinking that it'll be healthy for you. Okay. <laughs> so, so at a very young age, we were basically taught these kind of, these values. And we got it not just from TV. We get it from our parents. We get it from our friends. Um, so so what, what can we do about that? Um, well, in Buddhism... Um, there are some, we say, quote-unquote, right views, or views that help us out in terms of addressing the, the kind of mistaken views that society tries to, to, to put in our minds. And I think that maybe the, you can say the antidote for this view of thinking that material success comes from external things is actually what Jing Husher just talked about, which is the first two noble truths, which is the noble truth of dukkha, or things being unsatisfactory, and that this sense of unsatisfactoriness comes from desire, comes from craving. Uh, sometimes also we, we think of it as it comes from the sense of lacking. Like, I don't have enough, and I need to have something to fill that feeling of a lack. And so if we understand that, then when we see this advertising, we see that actually it's leading us to more suffering. Every ad is planting seeds in our minds that it's basically saying, we don't have enough, and we need this to fill that gap. And so, first, I think probably must be wise is to, to, to reduce the amount of, actually, this is one of, the other, um, one of the other resolutions that the pediatricians had. They said, pediatricians should counsel their parents, the patients, to limit total non-educational screen time to more than, no more than two hours a day which will limit exposure to advertising of all kinds. So, very, uh, very official sounding, but basically reducing the amount of ads that we see, so reducing the amount of seeds of wrong views that we can plant in our mind, um, but then having more exposure to the Dharma and listening to, say, sutra lectures, uh, contemplating the noble truths to see how they apply in our lives, so we actually can connect the dots. Oh, I see this object of desire. I see how I crave it. And, and when I do get it, how I don't ultimately get satisfied. So we see that process, and we start to let go of our craving and desire. So that's, I will say, is cultivating proper view. The other um, way to cultivate, I will say, proper view is through an understanding of impermanence. So anything that we're getting sold now, uh, for sure is going to have a time when it falls apart. So if we put our our feeling of happiness and attachment to it, well, at one point it would just disintegrate and go away. So if we can really see things as all being impermanent, then we won't, um, 
we won't attach to it so so much in our minds, but rather we often see something and we we cling to it and 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 make it our own. So that's that's one way to to develop, I'll say, a proper view. Another thing that I thought would be, I think, is very practical in terms of developing right view is actually not attaching to views. And what do I mean by that? Um, as a young child, uh, probably still now, I had a very strong tendency to attach to my view. Uh, I remember as a kid growing up, uh, my friends would complain of, or, or would, would tell me, you know, you're so argumentative. You argue all the time. And I would say, no, I don't. And they say, see, you're arguing. I said, that's not fair. I don't know, what, what can I say to that? You know, I remember being that kid and my friends would say that to me. And uh, now if I really reflect on it, I think probably a better response would be something like, oh, yeah, I, I think I, I'm, I'm kind of argumentative. I could definitely should improve that in that, that problem. You know, thanks for, thanks for reminding me. And that would be a much more skillful response, a much more uh, dharmic response. I would say not a fighting response, not an argumentative response. But of course, I was that, if I was a kid, maybe 12, 13, 14 years old, that thought never crossed my mind. I thought it was a very unfair thing my friends would say about me. Um, but, but now, I think, after starting to learn the Dharma and cultivate the way, I'm very mindful that whenever I have this thought in my mind, I'm right, you're wrong, to me, they go, wait a moment, something's not right here. How, why am I having this thought that I'm right? You know, why, am I, why, why am I attaching to my view about things? And so I think that's actually another very helpful teaching um, that will help us go a long way in life is to not attach to this sense of rightness, this sense of a self that has to be right. You know, there's for sure principles in life, that's dharmic principles, like we're talking about right view here, but actually attaching to a view and then using it to say oppress other people or argue over other people is, is not, not right, <laughs> is not, not skillful. And so for us, I really find that by, by realizing and really reflecting on this principle of not self, it actually really helps us to let go of our views because there's nothing to protect. What am I trying to protect here? I'm trying to protect this, this quote-unquote jing tuan, which is just a name, this body. Am I trying to protect this body, trying to you know, protect it in the world? What, what is it that I'm doing? So if I can, um, as much as possible, let go of that and see it as just a, as a conditions coming together and at some point it'll go away, then I will be able to have a lot more freedom to interact with the people around me a lot more happiness and peacefulness interacting with the people around me. So I think that's another really useful uh, way to, to counteract, you could say, mistaken views. Okay, so I thought of uh, maybe just uh, one more, which is the idea of life's not fair. <laughs> I remember also as a kid, so a lot of things I mentioned, there's a lot of things that are planted as a kid. You know, I see my friends having, maybe doing something that I can't do and I go to my mom and go, why can't I do that? Why can't I go out and, you know, go and buy this video game or, or play this, uh, you know, probably go to movies or hang out with friends at a certain time, you know, I have to be, I have to be at home and practice my piano or do homework or something. <laughs> I said, that's not fair. And my mom would respond, life's not fair. <laughs> and I would say, okay. Uh, <laughs> You know, I couldn't really respond to that. And uh, so, <laughs> however, in Buddhism, actually, life is very fair. And that is actually the law of karma. <laughs> the law of karma um, is actually in the Theravada tradition. They have a daily, they have a chant. It's not maybe not daily, but they recite on a regular basis uh, called the Ten Dharmas of Reflection for Monastics. And one of it goes, I am the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, related to my karma, abide supported by my karma. Whatever karma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. So, when you think about it, in Buddhism we basically say how we are as people, our surroundings, our environment, they're all coming from the karmic actions we've taken in the past which are the intentional actions done by our thoughts, our speech, and our actions. And so that's 
those are the fruits of what we what we encounter is, is the fruits of what we've done in the past, the results of what we've done in the past. And now what I'm doing is planting the seeds for the future. So can we really prove karma, you can say? Can we really see it in our daily lives? Um, on the scale of, of, you could say, past lives, current life, future lives, in a way I could say, at least I don't have that vision, I can't see it. But on a more, you could say, uh, this lifetime um, experience, I would say, I often can see it happening. I can see how the thoughts in my mind frame how I see the world. I can see the thoughts that I do create the environments or the, the friends that I make. And so I would say, if you really were to reflect on your life and use the, the principles of karma, you really see how you, we, we really have a lot of power to create our environments. And even if we don't, can't you know, prove it 100%, I also think it's a very pragmatic operating paradigm. You know, to say, okay, so if I take it as a hypothesis that karma is what's operating behind things as it happens, because I don't know if anybody has any better, any other better theory. The other theory is that society gives us this, everything's just random chance. You know, it's just things just kind of happen spontaneously, you know, which isn't too satisfying. You know, it just makes things kind of random. So if we say, okay, so karma's actually happening. Well, then when I look at what's happening to me, it helps me create a sense of equanimity, a sense of peacefulness. Because let's say somebody gets angry at me, well, I just accept it. It's something that I know that in the past I planted some cause. Maybe I don't have the wisdom to see it now. I can't see the causes that I planted that problem, that, that affliction in the other person to cause the ill will towards me now. But, but if I had that wisdom, I would see it. And so what that allows for is this kind of evenness of mind. All the things I meet in society, all the things I go through through a life, I don't react to it. I just can accept it for what how it happens. And then respond with wisdom. Rather than react with emotion, I respond with wisdom. And so I think that's another really valuable, so this is another quote unquote uh, right view in Buddhism, which is a, a, you can say a faith or confidence in the law of karma. Because this gives you a really solid foundation for your spiritual practice. If you don't have that, you can say, I can just give you another example. If you don't have that faith in karma, in a way, when you cultivate the spiritual path, what you can do is actually look for shortcuts. You can look for, you know, some magical method which will give you a shortcut to spiritual powers or, uh, you know, enlightenment. And actually, that's not what the teachings of the Buddha it's not that you can find some kind of shortcut that will, will, will give you some benefit if you don't put in the work. So rather, here, if you understand the principle, I know that if I plant the seeds of awakening now, someday I will reap the fruits of awakening. But if I constantly seek after awakening, in fact, it's further and further away. So what we want to do is, is plant those seeds and faith, we will know that it will come. So just... Um, so I won't go too much longer on this one. Just to finish, oh, you want? okay, uh, to finish off the uh, right aspiration or uh, no, I said right view, right understanding. Today, Jing Hoshi and myself uh, went to a bicycle blessing. <laughs> At twelve forty-five, we went to the uh, the park and nearby the Civic Park, and there's a quite a few bikes. Bicyclists came and they asked for a blessing for biking, so we thought. After, because we also knew we had the sutra lecture, we thought, well, maybe it would be interesting if we tried to relate the Eightfold Noble Path uh, to bicycles and bicycling. So, so we thought, okay, maybe, that, maybe just help it stick closer, I mean, stick more in people's mind. I thought, okay, so how does right view work with bicycling? Well, say you want to ride a bicycle, or you want to actually have the right understanding of a bicycle. So you're supposed to sit on the seat, and you know, you pedal on the pedals, so you actually can use the bike, you steer. If you had the wrong understanding, maybe you would think the handlebars are the seat. You sit on the handlebars, and then when you fall off the bike, you go, why is this thing not working properly? So that's the first one. You want to at least have the right understanding. You want to understand how a bike works. You know? <laughs> if you don't have that, then you'll have some problems when you're, when you're, uh, when you're biking. Okay. So the next one um, is right intention, right aspiration, 
uh, sometimes also right thought. And this one um, in Buddhism has given us three types of right aspiration. One is uh, renunciation, or you can say letting go, and that is in counter is countering greed. Uh, goodwill, wishing the for the welfare of other people, that's countering anger. Um, and then the third one is harmlessness. You can say it's kind of like compassion, and that's to counteract violence, aggression, you know, those, 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 those harmful qualities of mind. And so when we have these, those proper aspirations, it moves us in the right direction. So um, in, Buddha, in the Mahayana teachings, we also have the vows of the bodhisattvas. We often hear about the vow, the four great vows, you know, living beings are limitless, I vow to save them all. The afflictions are endless, I vow to end them all. Dharma doors are measureless, I vow to learn them all. And the Buddha way is supreme, I vow to realize it. And so this is what sets our directions. What are our vows? Where are we trying to go? And I think that's also very important. So you can see the first two steps on the Eightfold Path is first having the right, correct understanding of things. So what we should do is to open up the sutras and study the sutras and then make vows based on what we understand, what our proper understanding. Because if we, you can just think about it, and sometimes in society, um, if for instance, let's take the concrete example of the, you know, the cereal, you know, you, you get an understanding of that the cereal is gonna make you really happy, and then the toy is gonna make you really happy, and so you make your vow, I'm gonna get that cereal and that toy, you know, and that becomes your, your, uh, your aim in life. Now, for some things like the cereal and the toy, it's maybe pretty easy to get. But for other people, you know, it could be like, I want to be a, a millionaire. You know, I want to be a very successful such and such such person. And that drives their entire life for that goal, which in the end isn't really based on a proper understanding or a proper aspiration. You know, it's based on, say, greed. And then in the end of their life, you know, actually they probably will feel cheated. You know, they're about to, their, their life, they look around and they say, wow, you know, the, the thing that I was seeking for my entire life didn't ultimately bring me happiness and satisfaction. In fact, it might have ostracized me from my family, might be even hurt my body and made me unhealthy. You know, if, if we seek after these things without, tr without any wisdom, without any principle. So here, what we're doing with these kind of intentions is to, to go on the right path. So again, to connect that with the bicycles, um, I don't know if people know there's a Buddhist bicycling pilgrimage that happens in September. And they actually ride their bike from uh, this Bay Area all the way up to the city of Tanzan Buddhas and to a Baiguri. So they drive, they bike all the way up the coast. So I would say that the, your, for them, they have a direction. They're going to the city of Tanzan Buddhas and a Baiguri. They didn't have any direction, which is biking around in circles. You know, you could easily just get lost and confused. So if we don't have a set a direction where we're going, we can just get lost and confused. For some people who don't maybe bike at all, maybe you can think of just driving a car. I think that's a very everything. Everybody at least drives a car. So if you're driving a car, you don't know where you're going, then you usually just get lost. So, so that's the the second one. Is basically um, set your intention, set your vows but based it on a right understanding. And then that launches you into the practice, which uh, Jing Hoshu will speak about. So, so I'd just like to add to right intention. You can also see right intention as the will to change, um, meaning to change to change bad habits to more wholesome habits. So that can be classified as right intention as well. So Jing Chuan should just explain right view and right intention. And that was the the wisdom part of the Eight Noble Full Path. And then now we're moving to right speech, which is the beginning of the precepts part. So what are precepts? Precepts are guidelines for us um, to live our lives by so that we don't create unwholesome karma or unwholesome effects for ourselves in the future. So how do we create unwholesome karma? There are only three ways that you can create unwholesome karma, which is through the body, it means through actions, through the mouth, which is through speech, and through the mind, which is through thoughts. 
and it's the mind that begins first, the intentions that you have, that if you don't check it in place, then leads to either speech, unwholesome speech or wholesome speech, and body actions. So the next, number three on the list of the eight noble four path is right speech. So what's right speech? Anyone who's taken the five precepts would know that the, the first precept is no lying. That governs sp right speech. But there's more than that. Okay, there's also speech such, such as divisive speech, which means that you go and tell someone about someone else in the hopes of trying to make them um, fight and create strife among people. That's divisive speech. There's also um, double tongue speech, going to two people and telling them different things about other things. And then there's also abusive speech, which is, which is um, very common. What's abusive speech? You use speech as a tool to harm or to hurt someone. Uh, you tell them things that will affect them psychologically and make them feel bad about themselves. So the mind comes in, the intention comes in, in the speech as well, as to one way to check if your speech is right or wrong is to look at your intention. Usually um, wrong or unwholesome use of speech comes with selfish reasons or reasons that have to do with um, unwholesome states of mind such as ill will or anger or jealousy or hatred. Okay. And it was very interesting as we were studying for tonight's um, lecture, we came across a study made on how the Buddha would speak. And I'll make this interactive. There are four conditions where the Buddha decides what to say. And I'll give you the four conditions. And, I'll, and, and there's a mixture of the four conditions. And then you tell me what the Buddha would do under these conditions of speech, okay? So the first one is, Unfactual, if the subject is not real, is unfactual, is not true, is not beneficial, and it's something people don't like to hear. What would the Buddha do? He won't say anything. So you can see I'm starting off slow, I'm starting off easy, so it's very, it's very easy. It's not true, it's not factual, it's not beneficial, and it's not something people want to hear. So the Buddha will not say anything. Okay. So the second case is, it's not factual, it's not true, it's not beneficial, but it's something people like to hear. What would the Buddha do? No? I see he's shaking of heads. Yes, the Buddha would not say anything. He would keep quiet. Why? Because it's not true. You say something like that, you'll be lying. Third one is true. Okay. But not, I, mean, I guess this is the last one. People like to hear it, though. So that might be sometimes people do that in terms of flattery. So that'd be like flattery. I mean, just put, it, put a word to that. That's like flattery. You know, you're trying to get something. Maybe it's not true. It's not, and it's not beneficial. You're actually hurting. Sometimes maybe even advertising might do that. So, <laughs> so anyways, so the Buddha doesn't do that. Okay, so the third one, true. Okay, it's true, but it's not beneficial, but it's something people like to hear. What would the Buddha do? No, I see shaking of heads. Yes, the Buddha would not say anything. Okay, fourth one. So that would definitely be advertising. So it's something, <laughs> even if it's true, and it's, but it's not beneficial, for instance, it inspires greed, that would not be skillful. So the Buddha wouldn't say that. Not all, uh, not all advertising. Yes. Okay, the fourth one. Factual, okay, is true. It's not beneficial and people don't like to hear. Okay, that's easy, right? It's not true, it's not factual, people don't like to hear. Okay, so the Buddha doesn't say anything. Okay, now, listen. It's true, it's beneficial, but people don't like to hear. What would the Buddha do? Okay. The Buddha would say something? Okay. The Buddha would wait for the right time. Yeah, he would say it, but he would wait for the right time. So if something is true, it's beneficial, but it's difficult to hear. It might be some advice that someone needs to hear. 
um, that uh, may not be easy on the ears. So the Buddha waits for a, a right time. It could be a time when the person requests for advice, say, how was my behavior just now? Did I do something wrong? That's the right time. So you have, you have to be very, you can see the Buddha is really skillful in his speech. Yeah, so someone whose frame of mind is not ready to accept advice, don't give advice. You have to wait for the right time. And then last one, okay, is factual, okay, or true, is beneficial, and it's something people want to hear. Okay, no brainer. Yes, the Buddha, of course, would say. But he also said at the right time as well. At the time where the teaching is at its um, optimal. That means it's not just something people want to hear, but they also are able to benefit from it. So that's the way the Buddha speaks, which is really nice to know. And then the second one is right action. What is right action? Right action is still within the realm, uh, within the category of precepts, and it governs the body. So right action is also right conduct, and it has to do with purity of the body. Okay. There are three categories for right action. First, you abstain from taking life. Okay. Sounds familiar? No killing, the precept of no killing. Second one, you abstain from stealing or you abstain from taking what is not given. Sorry, no stealing. And the third one is you abstain from sexual misconduct. So that means that you don't, um, in the sutras it's explained as you do not have sexual conduct with someone who is under the care of someone else. So that means someone who does not belong to you. Okay. So where does this, if you so look at this, it comes back to the four precepts, four out of five precepts. So from right speech, which is the, uh, one of the precepts, no stealing, no killing, no lying, no sexual misconduct. So included in the eight noble full path are the basic precepts right there. Okay. And then we move on to the third one, right livelihood. And as we go on, you, uh, I will ask a question as to which precepts relates to right livelihood. Okay, what does right livelihood say? It means that when you live your life, the the way you earn a means of living does not result directly or indirectly in causing harm or affliction to living beings or people. All right, that means right livelihood, and this is really important because. A lot of our time is spent um, at work, and if you look at, if you do a further analysis of the Noble Eightfold Path, someone who follows this uh, properly will have a very peaceful life. And what does that mean? It means that when they sit down to observe their minds and to to get to the wisdom part, as Jin Chuan Shi was speaking about, right view and right effort, the quality of life. F it has a direct correlation to the level of meditation concentration that you achieve. And it's not the other way around. At a very superficial level, you can meditate to reduce the stress in your life because as you meditate, there are immediate benefits like your pulse comes down, you can relax your body, and you can feel uh, more peaceful. But that's only at a very superficial level. If you want to get into greater states of meditation, concentration, you will find that it's the quality of life that you lead that actually provides the level of concentration you can get into and not the other way around. That's why the Buddha taught precepts. And then from precepts, you enter samadhi, which is concentration, and then you get wisdom. So what kind of businesses that should not be undertaken? If you're in right, if you want to observe right livelihood, the first one is no dealing in weapons, weapons like spears, knives. Um, when I say knives, not knives used for cooking, but knives used to harm people. Um, guns, for example, bombs. No dealing in weapons at all that will be used to harm people. No dealing in human beings. That means no dealing in slavery. Uh, recently, in the news, there were. Uh, a large number of schoolgirls that were uh, kidnapped in 
I don't. I wasn't paying attention uh, in one of the African countries. Um, so no dealing in slavery. Why? Because that brings a lot of affliction to to the people. You bring harm to a lot of people. And if you are someone who's doing that, you can imagine if you want to sit down to meditate, your mind won't be at peace. So not just you're harming people, but you're also harming your own your, yourself, your your own um, appetite cultivation. Out of something when you said the weapons is that um, if you want to see one of these stories, um, I remember going to visit the Winchester Mystery House. I don't know if you've ever been there, but there's a Winchester is one a very um, popular gun maker in America, and made a fortune selling guns. And so I think when he passed away, he left a fortune for his wife, but his wife went crazy. I think she probably saw ghosts or something and all the things and. And so her house, she basically built basically this huge mansion with stairwells that lead to just like a drop off, you know, or just to a door that just opens to another wall or to a cliff they fall off of. You know, the whole house is built like that and it's become a tourist attraction. I remember going there as a, as a kid and we told each other ghost stories right before going, so to scare each other. But, um, but I mean... I don't, I don't know about cause and effect exactly, but it's, a, it's an interesting thing to look at is if one has a, a not a wholesome livelihood, um, you can actually create um, you know, uh, unsettledness in the mind when it's most extreme. Thank you. Uh, not dealing in human beings, also not dealing in prostitution, for example, that's in the list. The third one is not dealing in meat or meat products because that brings a lot of suffering to animals. So no dealing in animal or animal uh, products. Number four, no dealing in intoxicants. Why? Because if you deal in intoxicants, you're helping people destroy a lot of lives. A lot of family break up. A lot of families break up because um, one or more members of the family are addicted either to alcohol or to drugs and um, if you deal in intoxicants, you basically, or if you're a drug dealer, you're just furthering um, a lot of suffering and anguish for families. So this prohibits, like livelihood tells you, if you are involved in that, you should try to get out. And then the last one is no dealing in poison. And that's, that's like weapons, uh, poison in, that's intended to kill. So that, can anyone see any sim where this lies in terms of precepts? And this is very, very interesting. Okay, for anyone who's ever taken the Bodhisattva precepts, this is part of the Bodhisattva precepts. So the Bodhisattva precepts have a few precepts that govern right livelihood. They tell you these are certain things that you should not deal in. So isn't it interesting that the Noble Eightfold Path, which is always seen as a Theravada teaching, contains part of the Bodhisattva precepts? Right? Okay. See which ones those are? What? So for instance, the, the Bodhisattva precepts say you should not deal in intoxicants. In fact, that makes it a major precept. It's actually quote unquote worse to be a Bodhisattva precept to take intoxicants yourself is actually not as bad as dealing in intoxicants. Because as a Bodhisattva, you're out to benefit other people. So a major precept is actually not dealing in intoxicants, while well, a minor precept is taking intoxicants. So, so the, the mindset of a bodhisattva is basically you're out to benefit other people. So how could you cause them to be confused? How can you cause harm on them? And so if I really look at it, actually the livelihood is actually very important and it's very difficult, I think, for a lot of modern young people these days. I know young people often come and the monastery and actually think, what is right livelihood given modern society? Because oftentimes there's a lot of indirect consequences to our actions. You know, we, we basically, now the supply chain for all these goods that we're creating and all the things that we're doing are so divorced from the actual product we have in front of us that you don't know how you're contributing to human suffering in the world by what we're doing on a daily basis or just suffering of animals or suffering of or destroying of the environment. And so to look at this is actually a f fairly uh, difficult question in modern times. 
but still, I think it's an important question to ask, because, as the Buddha says, it determines a great deal of your sense of who you are in life, and what you're doing in life. And we create a lot of karma, on a daily basis on what we do. We can spend, you know, eight hours a day or forty hours a week or probably more for most people, working at their job. And so, basically, what are we doing with all that time? So, if you can do something good, um, that'd be really helpful. Another reason for the precepts is so that your seeds of compassion can arise. You can imagine someone um, doing all the wrong livelihoods. You are slowly... Um, denying, or is it putting down, compressing? Pushing, pushing, oppressing. Oppressing. You're constantly oppressing your, your, the compassion. Repressing, that lies, repressing. Repressing the, the seeds of compassion within you. Um, and, and that leads to a lot of unwholesome um, outcomes. Yeah, so, okay, so the next uh, one of the, the uh, Noble Eightfold Path is the right effort or right vigor. And so that's, um, they often say there's four types of right effort. But I think in terms of, it, if you just think it's two things, multiplied by two is a lot easier. <laughs> so what are the two things? It's doing good and not doing evil. So those are the right efforts. If you can not do good, you do good and not do evil, that's how you um, should apply your energy. And then Buddhism actually then makes it a little bit more subtle. It takes those and breaks down to two categories each. So for good that you haven't done before, you should go and do it. You know, for instance, if you, uh, uh, I don't know about a good deed, <laughs> although I just thought of the blessing the bikes, but I guess if you've never blessed a bike, you can go bless a bike. But um, if you, you know, if you're not kind to your parents, usually you can go and be kind to your parents. If you are, uh, you know, your spouse and, you know, you sometimes, uh, uh, kind of forgotten to really, you know, be patient with them for doing certain things and, and, and helping them out in a certain way. You can help them out in a certain way. So things that you haven't done, you should go and do. Um, but things, the next other part of that is things that you're, you have done, you should continue doing. So that is the idea is good that you have not done, you should go and do. The good that you have done, you should continue doing. So it's the idea of creating and maintaining goodness. Um, to, and the same applies for bad things we've done, bad things we do. It's not to say we create bad, it's rather we say we put an end, we stop doing evil things that we're doing, or we don't do evil things that we can see we can do. You know, if we can say we can steal something, we don't go and steal it. You know, we don't try to create any more evil or harm, harm, harm. Or if we're, you know, a, uh, somebody who deals in intoxicants, then we don't continue to do it. So I like to have a, if I deal in drugs, then I actually stop doing that. So that's to put an end to the, th the, the evil that I'm already doing. So basically, that's right effort. And it takes some... some yeah. Yeah. Rabbi Master said, if it's, a, if it's a good thing that benefits other people, no matter how small, you should do it. So that's, that's the two of the other times two. <laughs> and also, on the same as the evil. If you do evil, uh, no matter how small, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and they say because the evil bit by bit that's how you uh, accumulate a mountain but, but actually he, he also said something that's really simple say if it's something that you do that only benefits yourself and does not benefit other people don't do it only do it if it benefits other people never mind whether it, you have self benefit or not so, um, so I think that's actually a very good contemplation uh, because if you take that as a guideline for your life it helps you reflect on your own conduct so you look at you actually have to look inside and think to yourself: Is this actually good, or does this act lead to harm? And you look at each action you do, you can then begin to 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 decide: Okay, so this I want to follow, this I don't want to follow. So it's something I would say seems to be very general, you know, good and and not good, or harmful. But if you really start using that as your guideline for your life, you'll find that you're you're, you're you kind of have energy to go in a certain direction. You're going on the right path. In the bike analogy, you're pedaling the, the pedals in the right way. You're not pedaling it backwards. You know? And sometimes you pedal it backwards, it hits the brake, right? So you, then you fall off your bike. So basically, you want to make sure you're pedaling the bike in the right direction. You're going the right way. 
Um, so that's right effort. And after right effort, we have right mindfulness. Um, and so for mindfulness, I think the most practical way to look at it, um, there's many ways to look at it. Um, for instance, the standard is saying that the, there's an idea of you contemplate the body, you contemplate your, your, um, your feelings, you contemplate your thoughts, you contemplate dharmas, um, phenomena. And there's a way you do that. Um, however, I think for us, maybe a very practical way to, to do it is basically being aware of what's going on in our minds. Um, basically, if we recite the Buddha's name, or we have a meditation topic, or we, um, we watch our breath, you know, just to keep uh, aware of what is going on in our mind moment to moment. What are the thoughts that are rising? What are the thoughts that are ceasing? And just be aware. That's mindfulness. It allows us to be aware of what's going on, to be aware of our surroundings. Uh, because if we don't, Oftentimes, uh, negative things can come in. Uh, bad, bad things come into the mind, and it just kind of takes us over, and we don't even know what's happening. But if we're mindful, we can see bad things as they're rising in our mind earlier, and if we can just let them go, then they don't take us over. You know, we were just talking about affliction, for instance, anger. If we catch the feeling of, of, of nervousness, of irritation at an early stage, then it never gets into full-blown anger. And if you to catch anger at an earlier stage, it doesn't become rage, you know, it doesn't become uh, violence. So basically, the earlier we can catch our thoughts, the more freedom we have over our lives. So that's what mindfulness is really useful. And also at the, at the, at the bike blessing today, I thought uh, Jing Hojo actually gave a very interesting, uh, uh, I thought it was a very inspired Example, because we had to give we had to give a little talk to the the bicyclists, you know. So you imagine all these horseshoe of bicyclists, maybe 40, 30, 40 bicyclists, yeah, maybe 30, 40 bicyclists. So various religious leaders uh, spoke. The, the Jewish, I don't know if she's a Jewish rabbi, but she had a little she had a little hat, so she gave some a Jewish a little bit of a song. Most of them had a bowl of water and They're was it rosemary, and then they went sprinkled the water. Sprinkle the bike. <laughs> And so we were, we were there, we were, okay, so we had to say something. And so Jing Hushu wasn't sure, because I think it's probably one of your more first time experience with interfaith. Yeah, it was like first time for interfaith experiences. So it's okay, so what do we, so he went up there. He said, well, um, in uh, bicycling, we just talked about, so one of the bicycle, what the person right before talked about all the good stories, all the good experiences they had in riding their bicycle. And so Jing Hushu says, well, there's the good things, but also sometimes there's the bad experiences. You know, people who weren't very good at sharing the road with you. And he said, he said, so cars, they have bumpers, right? But bicyclists, they don't have bicycles, they don't have bumpers. So what do you do? Well, you have to have a bumper in your mind, and that bumper is mindfulness. <laughs> so with mindfulness, it protects you. Because <laughs> as a bicyclist, if you don't have mindfulness, you might end up in a collision. <laughs> Did I say that? Pretty close, pretty close. And then, and then he connected it to, because um, what I was going to chant was the Metta Sutta. And that even for the people we meet, um, which is the Metta Sutta, which is basically contemplating this kind of sense of kindness and compassion for all beings, was basically if we can maintain that mindfulness of loving compassion, then even if somebody is angry or mean to us on the road, we don't get afflicted. So on one level, mindfulness protects us in our surroundings, but if we also um, maintain, say, a wholesome mind state, like kindness, then even negative experiences with people get diffused before they even happen. So, um, so that's, that would say with mindfulness has a lot of, of goodness. So you can think of it as a bumper of the mind. I thought it was a very good analogy. So for the, we have this bicycling analogy. So, so you have the right understanding, so you know how to use the bike, you have the right aspiration, so you know where you're going with the bike. We have all the work and effort, you know, the, the idea of right speech, so you're saying the right things on the bike, you're not doing bad things with the bike. You're doing right actions, you're doing right effort, so you're moving the bike in the right direction towards your destination, and then you're mindful of your surroundings, so you don't crash. So that's mindfulness. And the last one? And the last one is right concentration. So if I follow the bike analogy, you could analogy you could say that this is um, 
making sure you arrive at your destination because right concentration depends on the first seven of the noble um, of the noble eightfold path to get right concentration. So what is right concentration? You could call it right meditation. You could call it uh, samadhi. Rambo Master likes to use the word single-minded. You, you, you could also say is a lack of false thinking. So how do we do that? That's where your Dharma door comes in. And the most basic of all, um, the, uh, the easiest of all the Dharma doors, one of which is observing the breath, and there are numerous ways to observe your breath. Uh, you could uh, chant a mantra, mantra. Uh, you could chant the Buddha's name. Um, you, there are other ways like using a uh, visual aids, like using a kasina or a disc of color that the Buddha also explained. So that really, you could bow. Bowing is a great dharma door. So really different dharma doors, but they all serve one purpose in order to bring your mind to a point of single-minded concentration. And the analogy for that is, say, if this cup is clear and if it contains water that is muddy and you lift the cup and you don't move the cup and you don't let any wind disturb the water, eventually all the mud will, come, will sink down and when that happens, you'll be able to see through the water. So that's what meditation is. You find a quiet place or you concentrate on your Dharma door until you get single-minded concentration and you're not thinking of anything else. And ironically, people sometimes think that um, you get there by making sure you're as comfortable as you are, that you're as happy as you are. But when I look at some of the, the, the life examples of the great patriarchs, for example, the second patriarch of China, um, Elder Master Hui Ke, he was the 29th patriarch from the Buddha, Buddha, and into, he was number 29, and in China he's considered as the second patriarch. He was ready to achieve single-minded concentration when he cut off his arm, because he was given a test. He said, he was told by Bodhidharma, he said, when, this, when the snow turns red, you will be ready. So he cut off his arm, he sprayed the blood, and he said, there, the snow is, the, the snow is now red. But that was because he, at that stage of his cultivation, he had single-minded concentration. And if you look at uh, more recently, Elder Master Su Yin, or Empty Cloud, he, reached, he gained enlightenment um, when The conditions that led to him gaining enlightenment as he um, was during a, a retreat that he joined, a Chan retreat, but before that, he almost died. He was, um, for all intent and purposes, he actually drowned, and he was in the river for a day and a night before fishermen fished him out. And his condition was so bad that he was actually um, I would say bleeding or leaking fluids from all the orifices in his body. But it is only through certain hardships like that that you get the resolve to press on no matter what happens. And I know people who say through a bowing session or through a meditation session, they're actually sick. Sick to the point that they almost faint. But they tell themselves, I'm not going to let this overcome me. I'm going to concentrate all I can I'm not going to faint, even though I'm bowing. And I'm just, going to, I'm just going to concentrate and get through this. And because of that intense concentration, in a finger snap, sometimes they go beyond the sixth consciousness and their inherent wisdom arises. So in your cultivation, in your practice, sometimes you encounter hardships. It could be physical, it could be mental, but those are just tools to help you in trying to hone your concentration to be stronger. So afflictions, the Ramo Master says, are just body. You just turn them over and they become body. So suffering and hardship, if you know how to use them, they become aids to your way. They help you instead of um, the normal perception of thinking that they're holding you back. So samadhi or concentration Right concentration counteracts 
what is called the five hindrances. So for those who like taking lists, the five hindrances are desires for, for sense objects. That means things that come to the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. And the analogy is, this is like taking a loan. If you're constantly chasing after sights and sounds, it's like taking a loan. That means you take a loan, and then you enjoy the money from the loan, and then what happens? You buy a new car, you buy a house, or you buy new clothes. And then you realize, hey, wait a minute, I have to pay the loan back. I just borrowed the money. It wasn't mine. And not just that, you have to pay back with interest. So the Buddha explains that when we seek after sensory desires from the eyes, if you like nice smells, if you like taste, good tasting food, if you always seek after comfort, we are creating unwholesome conditions for ourselves in the future that we have to pay back. The second one is ill will. Ill will is, you could say, thoughts of rejection. Rejecting discomfort, rejecting someone through, say, anger or jealousy, pushing people or things away from you. What does that mean? What does it feel to be, to be consumed by ill will? It's like being sick and in pain. You cannot be happy. When you're, in sick, when you're sick and you're painful, you experience pain, happiness eludes you because you're consumed by pain. So that's what it means to be um, taken over by ill will. So if you see that ill will has that effect on, on, on yourself, then you develop, you say, I want to stay away from states of mind that are ill will. The third one is sloth or torpor, that is laziness, sleepiness, which sometimes you get in meditation. Um, it's, it's like being drunk or you're being on drugs. You're in a confused state and you don't really know what's going on, uh, which happened to me uh, on numerous times when I meditate. There was once I went into the meditation hall, it was during the chant session, and I sat down and what felt like just only 10 minutes had passed and then the bell rang. I was like, oh, it's been an hour. I said, oh, that was, I was in samadhi. I was re in really good concentration. And then after that, the proctor came to me and said, hey, you were sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? So that's confusion. So that's stopper or sloth. It's like, you're just being confused. You mistake what is not real for, for something real. Restlessness is another um, uh, part of the hindrance. What is restlessness? You're unable to sit quietly, or your mind is unable to be calm. And what's that like? The analogy is, is like you're constantly being surprised by someone. Imagine you're trying to be still, someone keeps on surprising you, or you just want to relax, but someone keeps on pushing you, asking you to go sit there. And then when you're just trying to get comfortable, you have to move again. And before you can rest comfortably, you have to move again. So that's been taken over by restlessness. And if you see it from that point of view as never being able to rest, then you understand how restlessness um, is a hindrance. And then the last one is doubt. Doubt in the teachings, doubt in yourself, doubt in the practice. And that's like being lost. When you're lost and you say you're driving and you're lost, you don't know which road to take. Either way, you're not sure. You take you turn left, you come to a crossroad, you turn left, and you tell yourself, maybe I should have turned right. Maybe I should have gone straight. But you know if you have gone straight, and you still don't know where you are, you will tell yourself, maybe I should have turned left. Where am I? Maybe I should have turned right. That's doubt. Someone caught in doubt is never sure. You don't have a firm place um, to stand on, and your mind is always searching. So that's why doubt is also uh, considered a, a, a hindrance. So with all those uh, eight factors of the Noble Path, um, you arrive where? You arrive back at the first factor of the Noble Path. You arrive back, you arrive back at right view. So in the bicycle analogy, you're, you're concentrating, as in you're riding the bike in, the, in a direction, not getting distracted. So you're not trying to get the state, you're trying to get the state down the Buddhas. You don't end up in, say, uh, Sacramento. You know, you're going the right direction. You're constantly staying on the right path. And so you arrive at right view. Again, and, but however, this time, you're understanding the right view 
but I just described, um, say the form, um, the idea of suffering and not self, rather than just being an intellectual understanding, is an actual realization. So you actually, as this Bodhisattva says here, um, and the, t the Aptamska Sutra says here, so this Bodhisattva completely understands the four truths as they really are. So the Bodhisattva here has understood the four truths as they really are. So he's taking the whole full noble full path in the beginning of just understanding it as a kind of more of an intellectualist understanding, but then is actually put into practice and has a, a deep realization of it. So then it opens up to a true understanding, true, true views, proper views, and then a really proper aspiration of what to do with that. So this time you're not riding a bike anymore, you're riding a motorbike. Yeah, a motorbike. And the road is straight, is level and equal, and everyone you meet along the way is friendly, and the weather is very nice. Yeah. Or the Bodhisattva would have probably a trailer behind him and carrying all these other living beings too. <laughs> Right action. Yes. He, he Jing He Shu did. Um, bingo over it again. It's the it was the precepts. Right action is part of the precept category of the of the path. So it governs the body. So you have um, abstaining from taking life, which is no killing. You abstain from taking what is not yours, which is no stealing, and then you abstain from sexual misconduct. So the three precepts that govern the body, yeah. yeah. So the, today is the Eightfold Path, so hopefully we can all take a piece of that path and, and walk it. And I think probably a lot of people will be going up to the 16,000 Buddhas tomorrow, because tomorrow is going to be the bathing Buddha ceremony. So we'll probably finish uh, tonight. Uh, um, hopefully we'll finish pretty much right now, so people can get, get some rest and drive up early in the morning. Uh, if there's any questions or uh, things people would like to announce. Okay, so um, so make a couple announcements. So May 4th, which is tomorrow, a Sunday, there'll be the bathing Buddha ceremony at the City of 10,000 Buddhas. I believe the three steps, one bow starts at 645. So for those who really want to get up early and, and be vigorous and bow to the City of 10,000 Buddhas from the front gate to the Buddha Hall, you can do that if you get there at 6.45. I believe the ceremonies will begin at 7.45. And, um, and so people are welcome to go out for that. Um, the, also, the bowing, the 10,000 Buddha's repentance will be starting that evening with the purifying boundaries. So people who would like to participate in the repentance ceremony, it's a very, I would say, the kind of the hallmark event at the City of 10,000 Buddha's. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, it's a really... Uh, a wonderful opportunity to do that. Um, the very first few days is very tough. Your body has to kind of adjust to bowing 600 plus bows a day. But uh, once you get into the rhythm of it, your mind and body feel really light and peaceful. Um, the, the Buddha recitation ceremony here at BBM will actually be moved to May 11th because tomorrow is the Buddha's birthday. So our all-day recitation will not be happening tomorrow. It will be happening May 11th. Other than that, um, Reverend Hung Shur will be coming back very soon, May 13th. So next week we'll have Fan Fasher come, but the following week, Reverend Hung Shur will be back. And he'll be giving me the lecture. Okay. Did leave anything out? No? Okay. No? So the dedication of merit is on the back of your Dharma request sheet. You'll see it's in English with musical notation.
hearts of peace, with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may their minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. kindness find reward may all who sorrow leave their grief and pain may this boundless light break the darkness of their endless night because our hearts are one this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. stand and we'll bow to the Buddhas.